Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Affordable Rental Housing Division monthly partner call. We will get started momentarily. All right, thanks for joining everyone. Uh, we'll get started in just a minute. We still have folks coming into this room. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. My name is Kim Travis. I'm the Engagement Coordinator for the Affordable Rental Housing Division. And uh, welcome to this month's uh, ARH Partner Call. And um, before we get started on our agenda, just want to uh, share our process agreements as a reminder of um, an inclusive environment for everyone to be engaged with uh, with dialogue with us. So just trying to be mindful of these process agreements as we have this discussion today and with all of our engagements. So uh, thank you for practicing these process agreements with us. So with that, I think we will turn it over to um, Natasha to talk about what's on today's agenda. Great. Hello, everybody. Um, for uh, those who may not know me, um, Natasha detweiler Davy. I'm the director here of Affordable Rental Housing, and so happy to be with you all in the Zoom space um, Brady Bunch screen today um, and hope that you're having a good Monday. Um, and so we are just going to aim to talk through, kind of walk through the um, information that we'll be bringing to Housing Stability Council on Friday, so including 4% transactions, ORCA recommendations, and the next step of work around the ORCA and um, LIHTC, um, and then uh, check back in on kind of our upcoming engagement conversations and see what other questions, thoughts folks have. Um, and so I think that's primarily what we'll be doing. And I think um, I have a strong uh, team here supporting me, but I will um, aim to just kind of uh, walk through um, each of those different agenda items uh, and uh, see what questions folks might have. Okay, so uh, first up we have uh, the conduit bond transactions. There are five of them moving forward through Housing Stability Council um, this month, and this is the approval of projects, um, conduit bond issuances for uh, private activity bonds and 4% um, tax credit program. And this is a um, kind of the final uh, approval and recommendation process before financial closing of those resources. Um, we then have uh, two projects being recommended through the ORCA, um, Colonia Libertad and Commons and MLK. Um, and so maybe I'll pause there if there's questions on either of those recommendations. And then I also think um, we wanted to be able to share, um, you know, reinforce the uh, ORCA dashboard, which is updated on our website with resources. Um, the next item is kind of what to have, what comes next for ORCA, including the addition of tax credits. So yeah, again, I'll pause there. Thanks, Natasha. Yeah, any questions about the transactions that uh, Natasha referenced? I did put a link to the Housing Stability Council packet in the chat. So uh, take a moment to, uh, to find that. And if you want to scroll through, um, it can be a helpful reference. Just a quick pause for any question, questions about those transactions before we move on. Hey, Kim, it's Tracy or Natasha. Um, the affordability period on one of the projects for HTF, it's 30 years. And on the other, it's 60 years. And I don't know if there is a sort of back something behind the 
screen that says when it's 30 and when it's 60. Um, I don't, uh, I'm wondering if Roberto or Amy, if you are here and want to be able to respond on that, I'll also uh, look at the. Um, it looks the like El Monica is 60. I'm just trying to be more useful here. Um, and. Hmm. Uh, pine, uh, pine um, Woodland Hearth is 30. Okay. I see Roberto popped in here. Yeah, I'm I'm checking too, so I'm not sure I have an answer right now, Tracy, but we can we can check into it and if uh we need to make any changes, we'll do that. Uh but I can't yeah, I um I, I don't have all the information with me right now. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally fair. I just actually noticed as I was flipping through and we've been kind of thinking about, you know, going to the legislature, legislators are asking like, hey, what are you doing for mm -hmm. prevention about preservation? And just so I've been paying more attention to affordability periods lately. So yeah, yeah. I yeah, and I think part of, yeah, yeah, I mean, so I think I am, uh, so in terms of affordability period, I do think um, it is, I think important and I think we can continue to follow up. Functionally, we've gen tended to adopt a 60 year standard for affordability. I think that there's a places where that doesn't has not been implemented to have it work yet, one of which is um, Article 11 Q bonds, which we are putting in as loans. And then um, after the initial 30 year um, period can choose to either pay back that loan or satisfy the debt um by extending affordability another 30 years so effectively that is um i think will tend to often be 60 years or we'll get full repayment after that 30 year period um and i think that's like a lever in there so like if i'm looking at the el monica cover sheet it looks like while lift and four percents are at that 30 years to be able to do that um extension to be able to satisfy the debt the housing trust fund is still at 60 years and so i think there's those are those interactions that make um that are part of it but um i think as a as a rule of well it's stronger than a rule of thumb but i think our general alignment is right now for the state at 60 years of affordability um acknowledging there's some jurisdictions that have longer there's other resources that have lesser um, controls uh, therein. I also think related to the preservation argument, it doesn't necessarily, I think the duration of affordability as the measure of whether or not it'll be successfully preserved is a difference and a distinction when projects need additional um, investment to retain operations through that 60 years affordability period. Yeah, totally hear that. I, you know, I also know that our standard um, in some jurisdictions has had to be like, oh, well, is it if it's um, privately owned versus nonprofit owned, there's kind of a different lens for reasons that are just, you know, practical. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah just kind of paying more attention to that. So appreciate the the additional feedback now and going forward. Absolutely. Yeah. Any other questions around those transactions? Hi, Natasha. Brett George here from Wish Camper Developers. Hi, Brett. Uh, how's it going today? Good. Good. Uh, uh, maybe you're going to touch on it, but I'm wondering if you are able to talk any more about the wait list for the Orca applications. I received an email on Friday and didn't know more about it. Certainly. And so I think maybe we can um, kind of move forward to talk about, like to share the funding dashboard. Um, and so as the, and I don't know if, what you want to, if you want to screen share, Kim, or if you want to yep. just put the link in the chat, or maybe some combination of both. Yeah. I'll chat a little bit while we do that. Um, so yeah, I think that the, um, so we have implemented waitlist in Western region already, where effectively we have um, invested in projects enough that are sufficient to fully subscribe the resources and turn on and activate a waitlist. And I think 
Um, what the wait list are is are projects that have already been reviewed for pro for the standards within the impact assessment. So those are all projects that are um, have been deemed to be a, you know pass our our threshold for fundability. And so the idea is that when we have resources available, we'll fund the next projects on those wait lists. And so I think those have been I've had some of conversations with. Um, development teams around that because I think that's a difference and that is meaningful in terms of you know what it is you have in terms of confidence for getting funded um, we anticipate be getting or we have put in an agency request budget for this upcoming legislative session for additional resources to be invested and so when we have resources that are able to be able to support gap only transactions we would be able to pretty um, swiftly put those in through the orca and start funding projects off that wait list and we will retain um, that order um, within there and so i think we do have on our website um, the orca website the information around the wait list policy um, and uh, Kim here is now doing uh, screen sharing of the dashboard. Western Region um, has been uh, uh, with the all you know recommendations um, fully subscribes those resources. There are still resources um, to some extent through the set of other set asides. The and then projects in the other two regions are continuing to move through. And I think um, we are uh, likely to get into waitlist activated across all of those regions by the end of the calendar year is what we expect at this point. We will also now be adding um, some additional gap funding um, and also tax credits into the, um, in the new year. So has the Metro been um, closed down or has a wait list? I mean, that's, that's the project I'm actually referring to. And um, you mentioned the Western region being you know, closed and wait list, but we have one that's at Metro that's on wait list as well. Yeah, so the, and I don't know, I mean, Roberto, you might have other um, thoughts you want to share with the group. I think we, the in terms of projects that have gotten formal approvals through Housing Stability Council, it has not been fully subscribed yet. And based on the projects that we are currently reviewing to finalize recommendations for December, we do expect that it will be moved into the wait list. And so I think maybe there was um there you know so from a transparency um and expectation standpoint some uh intentional communication with uh development teams around that but but i think that that's the main thing natasha meaning that as as we've uh update the uh wait list on the website you can see what what's coming up so uh the closer the closer the project is to the last housing stability council that way at least goes up. So depending depending on where the project is. Uh, and I think we know that uh, at some point we're gonna be fully subscribed. And that's the, um, um, when we have projects sometimes that uh, uh, have to go back for review or something that have to be res resubmitted again, that also plays a role in where the uh, the project may come in for for that review so it's really that model of uh, again that have faster reviews and where they are seated in that list of uh, of, of uh, applications under review and i think for um so and i think kim put into the chat the information on the where you can see the in all the all of the pipeline projects list, um, which includes waitlist projects, and I also I think for all of our uh, work, and I think really trying to lean into transparency and accessibility for all of this information, and also as we're continuing to move forward, we'll be refining and um, updating the you know data looks and views around all of this to make sure that it's providing the best information we can, and it is all. Uh, Thing we're trying to iterate as we move forward so um but are uh, trying to retain commitments to um sharing information uh, okay so i'm sorry i'm not quite following that so you got two projects for orca this coming meeting and then um you were talking about the december meeting we have a project that's on wait list for metro I'm not quite 
following how that's fitting in related. So to what that means is that there are other projects. So, I mean, the, the, from like application submission to recommendation, there's a period in between there. So that, what that means is that the, the, um, bef it, before your project came through, there were other projects through the impact assessment, um, that have been working to finalize the recommendation to housing stability council that is queued in to be able to move to the December meeting. And so they are, um, seeing that ahead. Um, also, when we are adding 4% tax credits, we will be adding other gap resources that can be intentionally paired with tax credits. So if it's a larger project or one that is a good fit for tax credits, you'll have uh, uh, also opportunity to choose to pursue that one as a tax credit project as well. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Yeah. I, as far as I know, I see Kathleen, your your chat on the um, December Housing Stability Council meeting. I do believe we are having a December Housing Stability Council meeting. I do think that there is an issue, a challenge with the timing of that meeting and conduit bond closings, um, given the lead time between when that approval happens and when the project uh, is to close, and how that then starts inter intersecting with end of year. Um, calendar and all of that. So I think um, there will be a meeting, whether it's the most effective meeting for um, uh, conduit approvals is a different piece. And so that was probably some version of context around. Got it. That makes yeah. more sense to me. Not that there's like not a meeting altogether. Thank yeah. you for that clarification. Yeah. My, my um, glass remains hopeful for my project in the pipeline. <laughs> Yes, I think that's a, a default need for development. And yes, I think continuing to move it uh, through is right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so not hearing other questions on those project recommendations right now, I think I'll move forward our last and probably largest um, item for Housing Stability Council on Friday is um, discussing and doing the kind of formal introduction of um, the framework for um, ORCA updates and ORCA updates to incorporate tax credits and how we're going to be uh, stewarding tax credits moving forward um, with Housing Stability Council. I had previously um, given information about this informally with Housing Stability Council to start trying to build that uh, understanding expertise, visibility around all of the work at the same time as we were doing um, bigger in, like engagement with um, all of you and many others on um, the um, all of these strategies, both QAP related, how to work, how ORCA updates needed. Um, and uh, I think our, uh, let's see, at the beginning of October, I think it was October 8th and 9th, we had um, engage, like explicit engagement sessions on the 9% and then 4%. We'd also done a housing uh, Oregon conference session, um, have had lots of different conversations, including um, with the participating jurisdictions, I think uh, maybe that was last week. Um, and so in response to all of that tremendous feedback and all of those conversations, um, we have made some updates to the uh, to those frameworks, trying to be responsive to the areas that were really highlighted as critically um, uh, critical, and um, also it, like a, a, you know acknowledging in here that we were in earnest, really needing to get feedback and information as we were finalizing those. So really um, looking forward to um, talking through that. You can find um, the uh, updated framework documents within the Housing Stability Council packet. And I think um, Kim will also be able to paste, uh, put links into the posted versions. Um, and I'll try to do a brief version of kind of highlighting some of the things that have um, been updated through here, um, looking a little bit at the Housing Stability Council cover memo to do so. Um, and at the same time have also just created a, um, 
a very quick and pointed um, survey to kind of, to get specific feedback on um, those big bucket areas of policy, including where things have changed to get um, understanding about thoughts, concerns, and other feedback. Um, the intent here is that I will be, um, we are, so we are finalizing our um, framework with Housing Stability Council, um, ideally at the December council meeting, um, between tomorrow, this week's, between Friday's meeting on the 1st, you know, within um, within the next couple of weeks, we intend to incorporate all the kind of the best information we have now around what needs to be incorporated into the qualified allocation plan. And so including what we hear back from you through the survey um, and what we hear on Friday from Housing Stability Council to be um, drafting red lines into a QAP to do the more formal public comment process where there will be more opportunity. I'm sure we will roll all of the comments and feedback um, around the strategies to date into there, but the specific public comment process where we are tracking every all of the comments and responding to them and to finalize the QAP. Um, and so are, are trying to run dual train, ensure that there's um, access to information and opportunities to get all of the feedback on connected to each of those pathways. But effectively, from the strategy perspective, um, we are, um, uh, in, I'm introducing on Friday, we'll be hopefully finalizing in December. Um, I'm excited to get all of your feedback um, and we have a survey to be able to um, help support in a in a um, some of that, and it looks like Kim is screen sharing um, both those drafts and the link to the survey tool um, here, so we can make sure to um, so you can have access to that. Functionally, um, when I'm you know thinking about the survey, I think or the updates that we're making. Um, you know, we heard quite a lot <laughs> through um, the feedback. Uh, conversations. And so I think there's a probably a few areas that I'll try to not talk forever around. But um, uh, and so first is have definitely heard um, concern, curiosity around the amount of controls um, regarding um, ability to ensure access to fund projects in rural communities um, and a desire to ensure that we're really effectively um, getting resources to de deliver through culturally specific organizations. So we have put in, in terms of the ORCA as a whole, are proposing a, um, a targeting strategy with rural projects where we would assume that as we look across all of the projects that we fund, about half of those should be located in rural communities. And so wanting to right size both the way that we look at all of our resources and success, how we're measuring success to really be aligned towards that. Um, and so have proposed an update around that and definitely have included that within our, um, in the survey. Um, and then pivoting to the 9% tax credits, when we had initially circulated the framework, we had been relying on the set-asides, the geographic set-asides, um, and the use set aside. So we retain in within the 9%, the 10% set aside for Native Nation, 25% for preservation projects, and then had put the rest of the resources to be split across regions. Um, we heard very strongly um, through engagement, you should be, we should be using the same culturally specific organization set aside. Um, and so we have incorporated that within here as well. Um, let's see, another um, huge area of feedback, you know, is that we, um, well, I think we have, in terms of the 9% process and that framework, um, effectively we have mandatory and um, supplemental criteria. We did hear feedback that having economic and workforce impacts as a mandatory criteria um, felt disconnected from the work that we have been leading and driving and having kind of uh, shorty around. So we have taken that out of the mandatory criteria and moved it into the supplemental criteria. Um, when we are looking at, again, after we apply all of the criteria to identify what projects are eligible to be able to use, meet those criteria for 9% resources, 
We then have a list of tiebreakers that are embedded um, within that project program's project selection process for the 9%. Um, and we heard very strongly from a lot of gr different groups that the 9% resources should be prioritized for the projects that are doing kind of more deeper work in connection with the deliberate policy initiative. So we have added a new number one tiebreaker that would pull out projects that are doing concerted permanent supportive housing efforts, um, those affordable rental housing projects that are doing the um, uh, early care co-location. Um, and then lastly, um, also those projects that are meeting uniform design standards or inclusive design standards, focusing on unit accessibilities and alt, uh, which is obviously broad benefit to all kinds of populations include those including seniors and those with disabilities. Um, we also, in our conversations with our other public um, funders uh, in the participating jurisdictions, heard a lot of concern around the ability for um, participating jurisdictions to um, deploy successfully their home resources, and those have very specific expenditure timelines and communities have only very limited amount of resources and so have then added a second tiebreaker to that list to um, prioritize further investments in projects that are using home uh, resources from participating jurisdictions. Um, trying to think what's the next. Um, and I think that was the the uh, significant overview um, of the 9% selection process. Um, I do see in the chat, Robin, your question around co-location, just referring to the tiebreaker process for 9% after all projects are assessed against the criteria. If there are more projects that are um, able to use 9% than we have resources for, we would use a set of tiebreakers to get to them. And the first tiebreaker includes co-location projects where there's affordable housing co-located with early learning uh, child care centers, um, as well as PSH and uniform uh, projects that meet uniform design standards. Um, and so those would be um, effectively the selection process, which is what will be implemented into the um, or the QAP. Um, the ORCA will also be updated. So all of these updates aren't just updating a QAP, it's updating the ORCA alongside because those will now work together. Um, and I guess the other, another thing that we did hear quite a bit is, um, related to 9% in terms of, you know, if you have a project in a pipeline or on a wait list that is able to, that you want to consider to compete for selection through this 9% process, um, we are, um, we are allowing projects that are on the wait list to submit that same project as a 9% project for this through that selection process um, without pulling your project from a wait list on the 9% side. Um, and that's because the 9% credit requires an, an annual competition and selection process. Um, and so that wait list for the 9% won't continue past the year. And so projects will have the opportunity to stay on their gap only pipeline, compete for nines and either uh, be selected and move forward. If it's selected as a 9% project, it would be removed from the other wait list. If it's not selected, but it's in next place, then that project would have the opportunity to either hold the 9% wait list or the or the gap only, but won't continue to operate them on both lists. And I think um, the place where a 9% wait list would, would normally um, be leveraged is if within its end, I think probably the language in the QAP is, you know, if before October of the year that it was issued, the project falls out, then we would go back to the pipeline. If it's after October, we would um, just put it into the next uh, resource offering. Um, Oregon does forward allocate resources for the 9%, so that has gives us retain some a better ability to do that.
And Natasha, we have a question from Steve in the chat. Are the projects in the pipeline document listed in the order they are on the wait list, i.e. third housing stability wait list um, is third in line or will projects still in re Project still in review, but listed in front of it, be higher on the list. That was a horrible question, but I hope it. <laughs> yeah, I think what I'm I'm hearing, I'm assuming, Steve, it's like it's where is the number, where is the ranking in the wait list from the spreadsheet in the system. Exactly. So if it's um, where, where it is on the list, once it comes out of review into onto the wait list, um, will it be in its current position or will it fall behind others? That... So if it, um, so if in the circumstance, so where you have a project in the wait list and it chooses to go compete for nines, is that what you're talking about specifically? No, uh, no, like uh, ones that are listed currently in like on the Housing Stability Council wait list, but there's other projects that are still in review listed in, in front of them. Um, assuming those come out of review into the wait list, I guess, where would that, would that reshuffle the order or would they stay the where they are? I, I don't think it reshuffles the order. So I think, but I think maybe, um, and I don't know, and maybe this is the place where we need to, um, evolve the data we're sharing, but I think in terms of when it is on the wait, if it's been added to the wait list, it will retain that spot. So a project would be, you know, projects could choose to leave the wait list, but that project would not be superseded by a project behind it. Um, I don't know, Roberto, if you have other. Yeah, I think that, so the way you see it there, Steve, is, the, yeah, if it's right now, if it's, if it's an impact assessment review, so it's, I mean, staff is reviewing it, when it's complete, then it could go, um, uh, Yes, as a wait list for or housing stability queue, we have it as wait list. The only way that that reshuffles is, uh, uh, I mean, repeating what Natasha said, if, if one of those that are already there now as a wait list, if they decide to move out, that would in theory free up that space. So that you would, you know, you, you move up that wait list. That's the only way that we can see it being reshuffled. Okay. Yeah, and I think we, I, um, you know, I was saying earlier, doing a lot on da showing data and also needing to continue to think about the, you know, and update the ways. I feel like there should probably be a a, a list that is has the numbers. Um, yeah, I think we, I mean we can, if a number makes makes sense, we could certainly do that, um, but. We thought, well, it's without having a date for housing stability to it, that's what, the, I mean, we have it as wait list only. But again, yes, it's those that are uh, sort of to the bottom of that list that they will move up next. Thank you. Okay. Um see if there's other questions. Okay. Um, let's see. The four percent process, I feel like there was a but like I think a lot that we aim to add more clarity to. I think that was a the overarching theme of what we um were needing to provide more clarity, um, more information, and I think um functionally really wanting to align into the orca. Um, I think we do also have uh, acknowledged, understand that um, we want to make sure that we have uh, flexibility. I think we also heard from all of you that we need to have flexibility. We need to be able to have a mechanism to put resources to projects that are ready when we don't have others that are ready to be able to use resources. And so um, we have um, added that component to the framework around the 4% selection process. Again, generally, the idea is the resources, the PAB and 4% resources, along with gap funding, are available through the ORCA, and we would be funding projects on the cadence that um, of readiness that the ORCA um, has within it. So, and that is a wide, a wide band of readiness. It's not narrowly focused. 
and establish the flexibility rights to be able to identify where we have resources in a calendar year from private activity bond authority that we could dedicate to housing, um, where we would be able to um, activate that process to be able to do a timeline prioritization to say, all else being equal, we're going to select through this ORCA process. And where we um, see that that natural process doesn't get us enough projects on a queue in an individual calendar year with gap financing, we can select around that. So we have laid out both that in the framework of, of rights um, and then also detailed um, how we will um, are aiming, recommending that we approach that for 2025, acknowledging that um, as we have not had the work of implementing um, the tax credits, the 4% through the ORCA to date, we do have, um, see that we have around 100, 150 million in private activity bond authority um, that we don't have projects identified for yet in 2025. Um, we also know that we have limited gap funding um, and are can see very clearly the scale of need in our pipeline through both intake and the assessments that are going on now. Um, and so are recommending first that we look very quickly at the pipeline of projects we funded already, identify if there's any good fits to be um, turned into, converted into 4% projects. I don't think that this is all of them. I think that this is potentially a small slice um, where they are projects where there's development team capacity. Um, it is a large project using high percentage of the total development as subsidy. Um, and then are actually closing at a timeline where there is space to be able to do some type of uh, process to convert to a 4% modeling. Again, I don't think that this is a huge um, lot list of projects. I think it's though has potential to free up um, some meaningful amount of gap subsidies so that we can be funding projects further into the future using private activity bonds. Um, and then um, once we've seen what we are able to free up from our current pipeline, we we'll then go back and look first at projects that have successfully compete, com uh, submitted applications um, and have a closing timeline that allows that to move forward in 2025. Um, again, it's 100, 150 million in private activity bonds that we have to program. Um, depending on the size of projects, that could be a few projects, or it could be um, a higher number of that, but that once we have that pipeline filled for 25, we would go back to um, default status, which is um, looking at projects as they walk through the ORCA process. Um, and again, where those where our gap resources get fully subscribed, we would put in place the waitlist process. We have legislative uh, session going on. Um, in the first part of next year. And so that would then be opportunity to add those resources and continue looking forward down the pipeline. Um, and how many months for the readiness, how many months after the commitment is received does the project have to close? Um, it depends. I mean, I think the for the ORCA standards, you can hold a, an LOI for, I think, around six months out of each stage. So within a year and a half or so is the general standard that we are looking at. And, um, and I think there are definitely projects that can move much faster than that. And so the idea of a first quarter reservation of resources to have a a fourth quarter project closing would be kind of that expedited cut and that the rest of the projects would have greater certainty um, ahead of that uh, for when they have will have resources. You know, I think where we have managed very, um, you know, as we got to the place where the 4% and private activity bonds were oversubscribed across the state, um, had, uh, you know, and those were never, they those started out divorced and now we're trying to connect those back together, but also do our um, tracking and management of private activity bonds with a little better nuance in terms of being able to adjust and flex when it's, you know, outside of a calendar year that we're looking at. So trying to look at this on a couple year um, kind of look forward path um, around resource availability. And then if, it, if after a year and a half, if they haven't closed both with the private activity bonds, is that the idea? 
Yeah, I, I lost the end of your question, but I think that yes, I mean, so effectively we're tracking um, performance and projects continue to move forward at each stage of the development. And so in order to retain the LOI from OHCS um, about the gap in PAB initially, it will give, you know, requirements within there that need to be met by a certain time in order to retain that commitment of resources. And then there's another, the next look at the financial eligibility and so on down the line. And so if wherever in that process, if you, if there is something that has changed to either fundamentally change the project and it is no longer the same one, or you have hit a roadblock and will no longer be able to perform on that timeline, um, then we will redirect those resources to a project that can is going to be able to do that and that your project can step back and um, go back to the wait list to be ready or be reconceptualized to be submitted again. Um, I think our current, our previous process um, has ended up with a lot of projects that sat on desks without a lot of care and attention until it was really critical. And so trying to step out of the place to feast and famine on projects, but instead know that all of the projects that we are committed to funding um, are being prioritized for development. Um, and, um, and I think this is a transition and it's a process. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I see Natalie, your estimate of 2025 unallocated bond authority. We have of our, um, the resources, so let's see, we will be returning a small amount of private activity bond at the end of this calendar year that we, um, well, we plan, we assume we will return just a small amount of private activity bond resources from the current year that we don't spend in that year. Um, become carry forward, and um, we will plan to request available carry forward from the private activity bond committee in January of next year. Um, at the same time, we um, also uh, know that the state's um, population has increased slightly and the multiplier has increased slightly. So there is likely to be additional private activity bonds from 2025 current year that the um, private activity bond committee has access to. So there's a lot of moving parts to saying exactly how much we will have remaining. Right now we have, um, I want to say about 400, 420-ish is my, in my mind math. And so treat it accordingly. Um, on our either on our pipeline or that are working to finalize that funding um, commitment from our last resource offering around private activity bonds. Um, and I think we uh, see that between the carry forward, what's the potential, um, what's our known current year resources for next year, what's the potential that we could request, I think we're assuming it's 100, 150 million in additional private activity bond authority. Um, that we will want to continue forward with. Um, OHCS right now in the bond bill receives a direct allocation of 450 million. The state as a whole gets somewhere around a little over 500 um, at, lately. I think it's gonna be closer to 530 or something, 540 um, and next year, starting next year. So that leaves private activity bond committee something around 50 to 75 additional current year resources that don't go straight to agencies. Which was a long way of saying it's complicated, but around 100, 150. Looks like maybe next year PAB is going to be 550 total to the state. But again, moving pieces, we don't have complete control of private activity bond committee. We um, work in partnership and there's always um, com competing needs, but we will aim to, to access and program it as much as possible.
Any other questions, thoughts around that? Again, I think the, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, Kim put in the link to the page that has the survey in it, I think. No, did we do that yet? We did, but I'll put a link directly to the survey also. But on, on that QAP webpage are the updated 4% and 9% um, process and uh, project selection criteria based on what you talked through earlier today. So recommend, you know, uh, looking at those and then doing that quick survey. So, but I will put the survey link here in the chat as well. I think our plan is to keep that open through Friday, Natasha. Is that what we want to? I think that's right. I think we'll, yeah, um, for sure through Friday. Um, again, the sooner we know your thoughts, the sooner we can be incorporating them. We're trying to get to a um, draft, actual, the QAP actual itself um, update. We're working on the ORCA side update at the same time. So trying to weave all of these updated pieces together. Yes, and our plan is to um, send out a technical advisory tomorrow um, that will also include a link for this recording um, for people who maybe weren't able to join today. They can um, listen to this recording and then access those uh, drafts on the QAP page and complete the survey. So uh, package that up for communication tomorrow. Okay. Well, that is our exciting Friday that we have planned, and it's Monday, so we have a, little, a few days to get ready for it with some Halloween in between. Um, so, uh, uh, but again, appreciate all of your effort giving us feedback to date. I hope that you uh, um, can see places where we've made some deliberate adjustments and, again, are really interested in understanding um, the um how we've adjusted. I see Travis's question. Um, we are aiming to get the QAP. So the, again, the framework that Housing Stability Council, it's doing a bunch of things, some of its ORCA, some of its QAP, the formal public comment process for the QAP will, will run in tandem and aim for the governor to sign it by the end of the calendar year with the idea that we are implementing it early 2025. I think, um, you know, first quarter, it won't be uh, right at the start of January, so I'm assuming it'll be around February, but I think more to come, um, but soon. Great. Okay, well, I think that'll be our council meeting. Kim, I think there were, um, wanted to make sure to flag a few upcoming engagements for folks. Yes, well, and uh, to remind folks about the, um, we did have an engagement uh, last week for the Moderate Income Housing Revolving Loan pro Program. I'm sorry, I just messed up the name of that. It's the uh, Merle Program, Moderate Income Revolving Loan Program. Um, and so we had that meeting last week. I'm going to put the link uh, to that program here in the chat. Um, that program is developing, and so we're continuing to seek feedback about um, how to implement the bill uh, that was attached for that program. So that's uh, Senate Bill uh, 1537, and um, the webpage there in the chat, and there's a survey that's open uh, through November 15th. Um, we're also continuing to have uh, meetings with uh, various partners, implementing partners, such as sponsoring jurisdictions, uh, to understand um, their feedback about uh, the framework and implementing the program. So wanted to just flag that for folks um, and then uh, flag our technical advisories that uh, were sent out recently um, and remind uh, folks about those and signing up for those. So I'll just share my screen really quick um, to, to share that. So we sent out an advisory um, around the HOTMA 
implementation update. So that went out um, late last week. Um, and then, you know, again, reminding about some of these, these other meetings that we've had. This is where you can sign up and uh, receive uh, those, those announcements um, and track those meetings. So that's all I just wanted to uh, share that. And I think that's the, those are the main ones that I wanted to flag. Oh, I'm sorry. Other than we are having an ORCA office hours on Halloween. So um, I will put the link um, for that into the chat. Uh, bear with me momentarily for, for that one. Um, unless my uh, ORCA colleagues have that at the hand, at the ready to put that in the chat, um, but I will get that in there um, momentarily. So I think that's all for updates, Natasha, if you have anything additional before we adjourn and let me get that ORCA office hours in the chat here. Great, thank you. Um, I don't have any others. Um, just, uh, again, appreciate you all on this Monday afternoon. Um, it's been a very Monday, Monday, very Monday, Monday for me. So, um, hope you all are having a good one. And, um, uh, yeah, if there's other questions, topics that folks want to have, we have a few minutes left if there is. Yep. And I just put the, uh, registration link for the ORCA office hours on... October 31st at 10 a.m. You don't need to make common costume, but I bet you could. <laughs> yeah, orca themed would be you know, <laughs> really fun. It's not so a I standard think, for review, but it is. <laughs> yeah. I think that's all I had. Right. So. Thank you all, and um, we will see you next month. Sounds great. Thank you all. Thank you.